right now we're highly unsustainable and it's because we're a mining society. We mine the soils, we mine the oh. groundwater, we mine the forest, we mine the fish, we mine the minerals, and none of that is sustainable. They're, we're just de destroying non-renewable resources, so there's no future in it. Welcome to Peak Moment. I'm Junea Donaldson. My guest today is Richard Reese, who's the author of What is Sustainable? and just published Sustainable or Bust. Thank you for joining me. I really, I, I want to add that you've been studying history, well, for many, many, many years, but most particularly you're focusing on the question of what is genuine sustainability. I mean, it's a word that's thrown around a lot with, you know, and it's getting cheapened, like green has now gotten cheapened and, you know, anything's greenwashed. But what, what do you mean by genuine sustainability? It's good old-fashioned sustainability, fundamentalist sustainability. It's <laughs> a way of living that can persist for thousands of years without unbalancing the ecosystem. Yeah, it's... it's like the ducks here, they can li they've lived here for tens of thousands of years, and mm -hmm. the ecosystem is cool, and um, mm -hmm. that's what it's about. So, if you're really raising that question, and you s one starts looking, it's like most of how we all live, let's say, in civilization, industrial civilization, it isn't sustainable. I mean, it's that's right. pretty far away from that. As far as we can possibly be, you know. Just and sustainability is like Mars, you know, it's just a tiny idea out there that we don't think about or don't come anywhere near. So you're really asking what, not how we might get there, but, but, but the way nature works is if something isn't sustainable, it comes to an end. Right. Right? I mean, if, if, if there's just not enough food on an island, the animals that have been depending on it eventually die out or swim away or whatever, they disappear. Right. And, and so since this is so highly unsustainable, which we could talk about, and isn't thus going to last, then can you give us any kind of idea of what that might look like for human societies to be in the future, to be sustainable? And maybe also we've got some guidance from those who still are or were. Oh, I mean, we can look to the past. I mean, it's about slower and simpler. Okay. And um, so there's, there's much we can learn from the ancestors because they lived much closer to sustainability than we are. Mm. Mm. And mm. Uh, it's, we can't really say what sustainability is going to look like. We will get there. I mean, whether we survive or not, if we disappear, then it'll be sustainable. And if we um, learn how to live with the Earth again, then we'll be sustainable. But who knows what the planet's going to look like at that point in time? If it's going to be, you know, a desert or a jungle or, you know. Well, as you said, there's a lot of factors in. I mean, people are aware that things are collapsing now, partly partly digging deeper for oil or fracking for natural gas or, you know, the more and more desperation to, to get resources. So it would seem to me that people have a sense that we can't, and the population game, we can't kind of keep that. That's not going to, at some point, it's going to, something's going to crash. Something's going to get, and the climate as well. Um, but if, and so though we may not have a glimpse the people in the past, you know, what have you gleaned from some of the values or principles or practices they had that you think could help us know what sustainability would look like? Um, you know, family planning is a, an important part of it. Mm -hmm. You know, not having eight or twelve children or eighteen children. Um, there's 
sustainable societies limited the number of children that survived, and um, and they didn't overhunt. Um, they either lived in an area of abundance or had inadequate technology or had wisdom enough to, um, you know, some of them had taboos against overhunting, and mm-hmm. you know, so mm-hmm. they had systems for living with the land. Um, mm-hmm. But we don't know what the future brings, if the wildlife is going to make it beyond you know, the climate change and, and the collapse of civilization. You know, we're living in an immense bubble right now that's fueled by all this fossil energy. And as that gets scarcer and more expensive, it's going to really slam into our food system or our edu- agriculture. And um, we're not, I mean, we can't feed 7 billion indefinitely as it is, because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. we're, we're mining the soils and we're mining the aquifers, we're mining the rivers, and it just cannot last. And as the fossil energy gets more expensive and scarce, uh, it's going to come apart. And you know, we're going to scramble to survive because <laughs> the Safeway is not going to be there. And um, right, so. right, that the sort of peak everything kind of picture that. And, and peak tox I mean toxicity as well and pollution it's I mean there's a lot of things that are going to compromise life for ourselves and others I think about I, I think one of the things you have said is that um, does this mean do we return to the stone age is that what that points to right now we're highly unsustainable and it's because we're a mining society we mine the soils we mine the oh groundwater, we mine the forests, we mine the fish, we mine the minerals, and none of that is sustainable. They're, we're just d- destroying non-renewable resources, so there's no future in it. And, and you know, the ore deposits are getting scarcer and leaner. You know, it's, it used to be you know, 10% you know, metal content, now it's 0.01%, and it's a lot more expensive to process right. and that sort of thing. Right. So, I mean, we're sort of out on that thin edge of the, the limb. I mean, sort of, if you, you know, out on the limb, at some point it's just going to be depleted. It's going to be gone or too expensive to try and mine all of that. So if we look at sustainability being a culture that doesn't mine and use up all those resources, the best I know about is like, well, okay, then we were, would you still have domesticated animals? You could, you, you know, would you, would we have to, would we be thinking about going back to the hunting and gathering, you know, of the pre-metals age? But we're doing that with a world where there's certainly not all the animals that we had at that time. I mean, a depleted planet. So I, it's like I'm just fuzzy. What do you think? Uh, the safest path is slower and simpler mm-hmm. and, um, Domesticated animals and domesticated plants, especially greens, you know, annual plants, um, are very risky. I mean, if you have cattle and sheep like in Oregon, then the wolves are a problem and the coyotes are a problem. They must be killed. I mean, we can't have agriculture without controlling nature. You've got to build a wall between the domesticated world and the wild world, and that doesn't feel right. So, yeah, I, I would hope for a future when those animals are gone Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. you know the wild sheep and the wild beef you know the aurochs they were i just read about the horses the horses used to be fierce too i mean you didn't right now you can walk into a horse pasture and no problem but all those wild animals the wolf you know were powerful things that um, took care of themselves i mean the bison didn't need shepherds or ranchers to you know, shoot the wolves and the coyotes. So what you really are saying is that at the point at which humans, you talk about, use, began to really use tools, we, we separated ourselves. We pulled ourselves and said we're different than nature, all the rest of nature. We, we, we began to behave that way. And it led to domestication of animals and agriculture and you know, all the technologies that we, we see. So are you suggesting that what we may find in sustainability way down the road is the same kind of, what do I, 
that we're wild animals among the other wild animals? Yeah, that's where we all started. And when we were all animals, everything worked fine. We went along with nature rather than getting in the driver's seat and you know, trying to control the world and manipulate it and exploit it. So. And, and what I also hear, and what that brings up, is I can imagine somebody saying, why would, I want to, why would we want to do that? I mean, talk about the insecurity. I mean, you could get eaten by the other animals. I, you know, it's like, why would we want to lose our, our edge, if you will, that the tools gave us or, or whatever? Why, you know, isn't that a, t you know, I, I hear that kind of, the fear, the fear. Yeah. And that's at the core of the problem is, you know, would you rather have your computer and your car and your heating system or would you rather be running around with a spear in the woods um, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. nobody wants to be mm -hmm. wild and free mm -hmm. and screw the children and the grandchildren, you know, we need to stick with what we have and we're not willing to think beyond that, you know, because it's... We've been lulled, haven't we, by the, you know, the relative comforts of this and sort of we, we, we um, in, a, in consumer society, as you know, as this, it's like they just keep feeding the addictions to more and so on. I mean, I can imagine it's just easier to be comfortable than to think of being able to, to prepare oneself to live in, in a far more sustainable way. So we give up our freedom. We give up our wildness in civilization. Yeah, it's a strong moving current that just sweeps everything away. Yeah. Peer pressure, habits. Yes, yes. And, um, you know, and a whole lot of domination and a whole lot of, you know, boxes that, we, you know, that's the haves and the have-nots, that's, you know, and gender very, and, and color and racial, you know, uh, hierarchies and so on. It is a big, slower and simpler, Richard. Hmm. You shared a story uh, that we just read about a young boy who was wild and free. Would you tell, would you tell that a little bit to audience about Tarzancitos? It was around 1933 in El Salvador in the jungle. People found this wild boy. They saw him in the woods in the jungle and they tried to catch him and they could never catch him. And, uh, Two years later, I think it was around 1935, they finally caught the kid, and he was naked and just five years old. And he lived in the jungle on mostly fish and lizards and fruit and nuts, and he took care of himself. And he hated being in the village and living indoors and eating cooked food and wearing clothing. And he just wanted to get back to the jungle, to home, to, to life. And um, the, the world of the village was so sterile and dry and empty compared to living in the forest and sleeping in the trees so that the cats wouldn't eat them. And yeah, uh, yeah. You know, it's just an amazing story. And people think, well, we can't live like that. But you know, he's a five-year-old kid who lived for two years on his own in the jungle. You know? wow. It's just wow. a fascinating story. And there's lots of people that were raised by wild animals you know, over the history. Wolves raised a lot of children, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. people would set their kid down while they're working and the wolves would take them and sometimes they didn't eat them. And well, yeah, we certainly have examples of animals nurturing animals of different species. I mean, it would be, why not? Yeah. What I hear in that story and I, in your telling of it is that, year, that that yearning for freedom for that wildness is, is, is innate in us. And there's probably a longing. It's maybe been well buried by civilization or well snuffed out, tried to be snuffed out. But I hear that longing if I hear it, I think I hear it in you, you know, making that call, that trying to have us remember that we are like the other animals, wild and free and able. He's an example that we are able, we couldn't do it now, I mean, tomorrow. But the capability is still there within the human being to live that way in certain settings, certain locales. We probably couldn't do it in, in the Arctic easily without tools. Maybe the longing is there for that. Yeah, the jungle, the tropical regions 
are where it's easiest to live slow and simple. Mm -hmm. You know, the Arctic mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. the most challenging place where survival is hard and, and death is a constant threat because if you rip your jacket, um, you could freeze to death. Yes. And um, there's a story of um, the Danish explorer who's in Greenland. He got caught in a blizzard and crawled under his sled to take a nap. And when he woke up, his leg was frozen solid and he lost it. Um, yeah, I grew up in Michigan and across the street was a woods and there were lakes and ponds and I spent my childhood outdoors. There wasn't mm -hmm. much television and we fished a lot. I mean, we were always outside. And um, later when I was 40, I spent nine years up in Upper Michigan near Lake Superior where I spent more time with wild animals than with people. And um, I realize now that most people don't have that experience. Most people yeah. don't feel a, the sense of connection to life mm -hmm. that I have. So I, I realized that that was a gift. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's an, was something we need to get back in touch with. Um, these poor kids today staring at their cell phones and stuff, you know, they, I don't know, they're going to have a real mm -hmm. rough mm -hmm. way of mm -hmm. going. Mm -hmm. So just to thank you, I, because that, you resonate that longing in me too, that, that simpler, closer to nature connection that, that we can um, recultivate, reawaken to, maybe begin to listen again. I don't know what the right words are for it, but it's, it's not lost in civilized human, if one wants to listen. I think, I mean, there's people that say that um, it's like speech. If you don't learn to speak by, you know, three or four years old, that ability, there's a window when you can, mm -hmm. you know, learn to speak, learn to walk upright on two legs. And that imprint with nature might be something that you have to do, you know, while you're a child in your younger years. You know, if someone spends their whole life in New York City and at 50 yeah. goes out in the woods, I'm not sure that it's going to be as, as natural for them. It's, but I, that's, I might be wrong. <laughs> well, we'll get to find out. I mean, there's certainly a lot of people who are not comfortable. The other day, Along the trail here, I ran into a girl who's just terrified out of her mind because there was a snake sunning himself on the path, and she was just shaking with fear. Mm -hmm. Don't let him get me. Don't mm -hmm. let him get me. You know, and I thought, it's all right. You know. mm -hmm. It's just it's just a relative. <laughs> yes, yeah. But, yeah. oh, she was terrified. You know, in the last couple of minutes here, I just want to give you the, the space. Is there anything, you know, we could talk for a long time, mm -hmm. but... But I just want to say something, anything that's sort of close to your heart right now, or sort of this idea you want to make sure that, that we can seed for other people to consider, or just what you're passionate about. You know, I've been studying many realms of knowledge, and um, you know, who are we, where are we from, why did we get this way, and um, it's a story of tools, mm -hmm. and um, the, the Neanderthals, they were ambush hunters with heavy wooden spears. They'd surround a mammoth or a mammoth and then, you know, jam it and kill it that way. The Homo sapiens had lighter spears with stone tips or, or antler tips. They could throw those so they could kill from a distance, so they could kill more animals, and then they got traps and barbed fish spears mm -hmm. and um, <clears throat> nets. And so we kept evolving more and more technology for killing more and more food. And the, the big animals kind of faded off. And then we started eating medium-sized animals and then rats and birds. And so we got too good with the tools. And it seems... In this Tarzancito in El Salvador, he lived without tools. He lived with his hands, and he mm -hmm. ate everything raw, and mm -hmm. um, he slept in trees, mm -hmm. and he was sustainable. You know, he didn't disrupt yeah. the forest. Yeah. yeah. And this game with tools is, is very risky because 
you know, if we were rational and reasonable, we would think, you know, I, I, is this going to be too much? Is this bow and arrow? And, you know, oh, my God, you know, what a terrible weapon. You know, could really kill a lot of animals with that bow and arrow. You know, and, and we don't think, what's the consequence of that? We, yes, yes. We okay. build 440 nuclear power plants before we imagine a way of dealing with this super toxic waste that lasts for hundreds of thousands of years. And so we're really clever on the tool-making side of the game and very undeveloped on the foresight side of the game. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. is a serious defect in who we are. And so the healing process is going to be to either learn foresight or back off on the technology. And sort of now we're in a trap because those who have the best weapons and tools do better than those who don't yeah, and yeah. so it's 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 it keeps it keeps you know you know this, up, the, yeah. right it's the king of the mountain game and it's like it appears uh, to be without an end it appears. well it will end yeah mm, mm. the peak of the temporary peak of um, this bubble of energy is one side and on the other side is climate and is we're in a no man's land of mm. you know on mm. one hand we're not going to have anything to eat and on the other hand you know the climate change could suddenly our entire food system is dependent on this climate that we have now which has been unusually stable for 10,000 yes, years yes yes and it's the story of history is that this is a freak period in time, this stability, this warm weather. And uh, I was just watching a video today of Greenland. Uh, glaciers are melting so fast and the rivers are just roaring and knocking down bridges. It's just, you know, um, so <laughs> change is coming. And, yeah. <laughs> and, and it's happening quickly. Yeah, I mean, yeah. for us to be able to just look at the differences, just to say in the two, three, five years. Yeah. It's like, it's just... Accelerating, ratcheting up. So, I guess that's an important. And the other thing is, um, there's nothing more important than to understand what sustainability means. And as a society, it's just virtually an unknown idea, except mm -hmm. we call everything sustainable sustainable mining, sustainable logging, sustainable forestry, or sustainable agriculture. And that's just a marketing hype, you know, it's, it's just nonsense, or what I call ersatz sustainability. But right now, we've got this vast communication system where we can talk to people around the world. And I think now is an ideal time to discuss the subjects of sustainability because it's so unknown and we're plunging into this storm, you know, the, the if anyone survives the storm, it would be good if there was some notion of sustainability that made it to the other side. And so what I'm especially talking to are movie makers, writers, playwrights, song makers, you know, to get spread, get the discussion going, you know, because yeah. yeah. it's, it's so important and it's so unknown. So. And we can't... It seems so important that we have some vision of where we're going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so if you have a vision of what is sustainable living like for post-industrial civilized humans, some pictures, some possibilities, people can consider moving that way instead because what we know, this is all normal. Exploiting everything is normal. Yeah. This energy bubble that we've, we've lived in, no one in living memory hasn't been, how do I say, it's been part of, the lives of everyone that's that's alive now. I mean, the, the fossil fuel bubble. I don't think we have anybody 150 years old still on the planet that would remember life before that. So this is what we think is normal. And we can't imagine it being different, or, you know, do, other than a few small changes. But to, to talk about a life where we are either really, really mindful of what we use tools for, which looks to me like taking the technology ladder way, way, way down to a much, you know, simpler level, hugely simpler. Um, no, we won't be sewing and canning and moving around in vehicles and metal. There won't be metals, right? That's yeah. part of the technology. Right. Clay, ceramics. 
<laughs> so I think your notion of, of bringing that into the, onto the table for us to both imagine it and discuss it um, should, be, should be sustainability 101. It should be the first thing kids get in kindergarten, first grade, and on up. There's a pattern in history. You know, every civilization collapses. They destroy what they depend on for survival and, and collapse. And then the survivors regroup and repeat the same mistakes. And you know, it's, it's been over and over and over and over again. And it's the easiest way to come out of a collapse is to do what you already know. Yeah. And um, so it's the easiest but the dumbest way out of the storm. You know, the, Pursuing mindfully sustainability is the most difficult, but the smartest mm. way to emerge from the storm. And, mm. and you know, there's not, I don't, I'm not bidding everything that we're going to succeed at that, but um, it feels like what I need to be saying with my life at this point in time. Yeah, yeah, it's just, it's just shit. Thank you for doing that. I want to say that, that I am enriched by reading and you're sifting through others, other cultures, other observers, other writers, which you've done a lot of in Sustainable or Robust as well, and your own and your own reflections on that. It's sort of like has helped me pare down my thinking, and I appreciate that. And I think, you know, you've begun. You're doing it. You're, you're getting that question in front of us that I think we'll need to carry that question and, and exploration for the rest of our lives, and I hope the young folks do it after us. Yeah. My ideal audience is the creative people, the, the people, the idea makers, yeah. and, and but everybody else too. I mean, I'm also talking to them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's time we talk about this and have a serious, you know, talk Thank about the birds and the bees. <laughs> <laughs> and life continuing, yes. <laughs> Avoiding extinction. Yeah. Thank you. Avoiding extinction. Yeah, I think I could, that could matter a lot. Oh, that's a lot of this. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. keep driving. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for You're this well. conversation. Thank and for you. those of you who are the creative folk that, 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 that Richard, Richard says, let's, 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 let's give us some ideas, give us some pictures, give us some songs. What is it like to be really sustainable? I'm Janea Donaldson. This is Peak Moment. My guest is Richard Reese, and thank you for joining us. Thank you.